It's my pleasure to introduce to most people here, but some of you have already read his books and have heard him lecture before, Walter D. Myers. Um, in 2012, he was named the National Ambassador of Young People's Literature. He's been traveling the country talking about how important it is to read and to understand the gap that we have today in America, but not only in America, across the world. He is an individual who has written more than 80 books for children and young adults. His books are riveting. They're important, they're stimulating, um, they're graphically beautiful, like this one. And if you haven't seen some of his books, go down to Poet Employees and you'll see many of his books there. I said he writes for children, but he also writes for young adults, like Monster and Harlem are two of the books, and again, they're down in the bookstore. He is renowned in what he does and how he does it. Um, he was born and raised in Harlem, and now lives in uh, New Jersey. I, I already mentioned that he has written more than 80 books, and he's been a bestseller for many, many years. But here's an interesting thing. When asked, you know, how do you write? How, how, do, how do you write so much, and, and how do you get it all together? His response is, well, I first write an outline, scribble out that outline, then I get pictures of the characters. My wife takes those characters and put them up on a board. And then I go back and I write the story. He says he loves to write, he loves to create, he loves to explore through the art of writing. And he has done a phenomenal job. I know that all of us are really going to enjoy and be stimulated by what he says. There's so much that I could say about him today, but I, I, I'm going to leave you with this thought. There are many people who write. There are many people who have the gift of writing and creating. But Walter D. Myers is a very special man who comes to us today to share with us what he does, how he does it, and the fact that he is touching many lives. Without further ado, I present to you Walter D. Myers. Good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's a bit chilly. It's cold down here. Uh, they had promised me uh, warm weather the whole time. <clears throat> this is a very interesting time in American letters. We are in a period of transition. Uh, we've been in periods of transition before, but this is a very important one. Um, the demographics of the reading public is changing. Now, in the school systems, the, there was a time when the school system was 80% um, Caucasian, 80% uh, Caucasian, 20% uh, uh, black and, and, and others. Now it's, it's radically changing. It's radically changing so that uh, approximately 40 to 45% of the children in our schools are either black, Asian, or Latino. That's an awful lot, and that, that represents a change. But within that change, there's another change. There was a time when even the poorest people in our country uh, had jobs. So my dad, uh, my stepdad, for example, was a janitor. 
He was a janitor, and my mom did day's work. That means she went out and cleaned people's apartments. But what that did, that brought, brought the language of the workplace into my house. My dad would go to work at a U.S. Radium Corporation, and whatever he saw there, he brought home. Whatever happened, he brought home. Whatever my mom saw, she brought home. When my big sisters uh, went out to work, whatever they saw, they came home, and they brought the language of the workplace and of their co-workers into the house. Today, so many of our people are not employed. Now, I think uh, Mitt Romney, who I did not particularly care for, um, said that 47% of, of Americans are making a uh, tax contribution. And what's happening really is that so many people don't have the workplace anymore. They don't have the workplace anymore. There are entire communities. If you go through the communities at 8.30 in the mornings, you will see young men standing on the corner. They have no jobs to go through. To. Now, one of the things that's being missing here, of course, is the income. You know, there's, no, <clears throat> there's no income, but another thing that's, that's missing is the language of the workplace. How do children learn new words? How do they learn words that they are now going to be able to use, that they're going to hear uh, from their parents and have cognitive opportunities? How? <clears throat> the result of this is that we're getting children who begin school from five to 15 months behind. They begin school, they begin their little school careers. Here's a, here's a five-year-old who's beginning school with perhaps a working vocabulary of 35,000 words, while another kid is beginning school with a working vocabulary of 85 to 100,000 words. Now the problem with this is that the kids who are behind, and they're behind because their communities are very often not only economically impoverished, but language impoverished as well. So they are coming to school five to, to 15 months behind, and they most often don't ever catch up. They don't catch up. I've been traveling the country for the last year and a, year and a half as national ambassador. My, my medal, you see. You know, you know, I, I was appointed by the Library of Congress, supported by the, Chil the uh, Children's Book Council and the Every Child a Reader Foundation. But I'm talking about literacy across the country. We're talking here about books, and we want people to read. But if we don't get people who can read, what are we going to do? What are we, and the indication that is that we're getting fewer and fewer readers in this country people who actually read books. The markets have changed over my life. I'm an old man now. <laughs> um, the markets have changed. When I first got into the children's book field, the market, the major market, was libraries. You, know, you sold your books to libraries. That changed in the early 70s. It changed in the, in the early 70s for two reasons. One was the Thor uh, decision, which um, removed the expense 
uh, allowance for books in warehouses. But the other thing was big companies began to buy up the bookstores. There's an ITT would buy up a publishing company. Uh, a conglomerate from Germany would buy up a publishing company. And they were looking at the bottom line. And the bottom line for them was the bookstores. It, it either made money now or we, did, we don't need it. When I was first in this business, uh, very often a, a book would be in libraries for two years, three years before it was, before it actually caught on, before it caught in for the schools. And books would, could last 15, 20 years. Today, a book comes out, man, if it doesn't, if it doesn't hit right away, it's gone. It's gone. There's no reprint. It's not selling fast enough. Then it changed from the um, uh, libraries back to the bookstores because the libraries were not generating enough money. And we began getting the blockbuster book, the blockbuster book. My friend Judy Bloom, uh, who was one of the first blockbuster, my friend uh, who did the Babysitter's Club, Goosebumps. Oh, bookstores were rocking then. Bookstores were rocking. What suffered at that period was historical fiction. Historical fiction uh, uh, suffered. Some other kinds of books suffered. Now the libraries are closing. The libraries are closing at an alarming rate. And Many, many books, many, 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 many cities, what's going on is the small libraries are, are closing and they announce, oh, we're building up the, the main library downtown. We're building up the, the downtown library, but the small libraries, the people who know the communities and neighborhoods are closing. How many bookstores have closed? You know, in New York City, it's hard to find a bookstore. There used to be a bookstore on every other corner. Now you have Amazon and you have e-books. The problem with Amazon, are young people buying books from Amazon? I don't think so. I don't think so. How about the e-books? The e-books put a barrier between the reader and the um, uh, book and the publisher. I mean, you have to have the Kindle, the Nook. And do poor people have Kindles and Nooks? Well, some do. Some do, but an awful lot don't. So where are we going to get our readers? When I first came into the, into the book business, uh, a good friend of mine from Virginia uh, wrote a book called The All-White World of Children's Books. Because at that time, there were no people of color in the books. I came in as part of her effort. She's a very lovely white woman. I came in as part of, of her effort. And she reached out. One of the people that benefited from her interest was me. I've been in this book business since 1969. I've been writing books and publishing books. It's been a wonderful life for me. But now I'm beginning to wonder. Our country is being divided into people who have and people who don't have. England, UK, is being divided into people who have and people who don't have. One of the major problems I'm seeing, everyone sees the economic problems. That's a cool mustache, man. <laughs> no. uh, we all see the economic divide, that, that economic gap. But are we seeing the language gap? 
Are we seeing that so many kids cannot read? It's not that they choose simply not to read. They cannot read. They cannot read. I go to prisons, juvenile prisons, throughout the country. And I can tell which kids are going to leave that juvenile prison and never come back. The ones who can read. At least they have a, have a shot. Those kids who cannot read, were, they'll go out of, of, the, of the prisons, but they're coming back. They're coming back. In our society, my dad could neither read or write. He couldn't read or write. But he prided himself on the fact that I never went to bed hungry. Was, my children never went to bed hungry because he worked as a, as a janitor. And when things got tough, he worked down on the docks. Those jobs don't exist anymore. And we're not looking at those jobs. We're not, we're not looking at those people anymore. What we're saying is, well, um, uh, we don't want to have a welfare state. We don't want to have this. But forget the jobs for, for just for a few uh, moments. What's happening to, to the language of the workplace? How are these people going to become readers? I, I got a call from PBS recently asking me, we have lots of, but the, but the question was, we have lots of popular young adult fiction. We have books about vampires, and, uh, and we, have, we have books about uh, uh, these sort of steamy love affairs and uh, this kind of, but are these kids now moving to the classics? Are they, are they moving away from the pop books to the classics? And the answer is, yeah, the same percentage, maybe 10%, because America is not a nation of readers, maybe the same 10% is moving from the pop books to the classics. But the pool of overall readers is shrinking. It's shrinking. More and more kids simply cannot read. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? When I was quite a bit younger, and my son, who sits there in the back, you know, when, when he was a ki kid, I could, number one, afford books to give to him. I could uh, read to him. And as a family, as a family, uh, we read. His mom read, he read, I read. We had reading evenings. He grew up to be um, a reader, a writer, and an illustrator. People say, oh, he's so bright. No, he's not. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's, you know, and it sounds a little humorous, but it's not. What, he came from a family background that gave him those tools. He came from a family background. You know, one of the things that I've learned, I learned that all of the brilliant things that I discovered, that I read about and accepted, I didn't. I had the family momentum who gave me those values, those morals, who pointed me in the right direction. And right now, we're, we're beginning to lose those things. Okay, so what do I do? Um, I want to write books to entice those kids who don't read into the books. I want to entice them. I want to say to these kids, come. Come. There's something in this book for you. There is something in this book for you. This book has your story in it as well as mine. And, you know, a little girl wrote to me 
She said, you wrote a book called The Blues of Flats Brown. I love that book. And I said, you know, it's about a dog that plays the blues. I said, you, you, like, uh, you like the blues, huh? She said, no. <laughs> um, you like dogs? She says, no. Oh, well, okay, <laughs> what do you like about the book? <laughs> she says, he, he wears glasses just like me. And what, we, what we're needing is books which reflect the lives of the people we want to read the books. You know? And so this is what I have been trying to do. You know, if I write a book, I will have some kid write to me, 13-year-old girl wrote to me about a book called Slam. Slam is, is a black basketball player in the, in the inner city. And his trouble is making it on the team and how uh, the coaches, coaches were on his case. And she said, he is just like me, except I'm, I'm a girl and, and, and I'm blonde and blue-eyed and white. But other than that, he's just like me. You know? And I, I, I thought about that. And I said, you know, I don't have to write good books. You know, all I have to do is to include the lives of kids who need their lives included. When I was a kid growing up in Harlem, I grew up in Harlem, I, I loved to read. I loved to read. My mom taught me to read by reading to me uh, every day, maybe for 30 minutes. And she, what my mother read was true romance magazines. You know? And I listened to those true romance magazines. And I, I loved it, not because I knew what was going on uh, I, I, with the true romance, but because it was mama. Mama was reading, you know, and I would stand in front of a mirror and try to, to get my bosom to heave. You know, you know, oh, I know. You know, I tried on my sister's makeup. My, my dad said, what are you doing, boy? You know, you know, you know. But, you know, I began to identify with the books. I began to identify with the books. I began to look at the books, and I became the characters. I became the characters. I, I, was, I rode with, with, with uh, Robin Hood. I was there in Sherwood Forest. They didn't mention me very often, but I, I was there. You know, I, was, I was there uh, with David and Goliath. If Goliath had beaten David, I had his back. You know, I was going to fight next. Later on, when I was having difficulties with my mother, I was also reading Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And Stephen Daedalus, in that book, was having difficulties with his mother. I identified with that. So how did, how did I drop out of high school? Why did I drop out of high school? I dropped out of high school because I got lost at around 15 years, 15 years of age. I got lost. I got lost. I got, my family began to, to have troubles. I dropped out of high school joined the army, came, learned how to kill people uh, in the army, which is not that, not that much in demand in civilian life. But what happened, I also found out something of, I didn't find myself in books when I was a kid. In Robin Hood, they didn't have any, any, any of the merry men being black. And I loved the Red Badge of Courage. Loved that book, Henry Fleming, Going Through the Woods. But, but they didn't have any of the black soldiers. And I loved um, all of the stories, but I didn't find myself in those stories. Oh, yeah, right. There was uh, Mark Twain and Nigger Jim. I loved Mark Twain, but I wasn't that happy being Nigger Jim, you know. Uh, and so I decided at 15 years of age that I would no longer be black because it didn't seem to be, but books transmitted values, yes? Say yes. 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 
And I wasn't in the book, so I had no value. I had no value. So I decided I wouldn't be black anymore. There was nothing great about being black, you know. And I decided that what I was going to be was an intellectual. I'm going to be an intellectual, no longer black. I'm not going to think in terms of race. But then when I found out that my parents could not afford to send me to college, I dropped out of high school. Years later, I had a conversation with James Baldwin. You know, and I told James Baldwin that his story, a story called Sonny's Blues, was the first time I had read anything about my neighborhood in Harlem. And James Baldwin said, Growing up in Harlem, I felt the same way. And what I did was to go to Europe. And I began thinking about it. James Baldwin went to Europe. Richard Wright went to Europe. All the black intellectuals went to Europe in the 50s. This is before your time, son. <laughs> so what I felt really good that James Baldwin could relate to my story. But when I left, when I walked away from James Baldwin, I said, I wish I had known about that when I was 14 years old. I wish I had known what Baldwin fe felt and so many of these guys felt when I was 15. I would not... The idea hit me like a train. <laughs> and so what I, what, I, what I needed to do once I began writing books was to bring value, not, not ideas so much, but value to all readers. Bring value to all readers. What do I do now, my, my daily routine? This is easy. You want, you want to write books? Actually, I've written, I've published 106 books. I've got, I, I, I've got, no, no, no. I have six books under contract. No, I have four books in the works, you know, in galleries or, or copy, copy editing. Six more books on the, I could die today, books would keep coming out, you know. For, you know <laughs> didn't he die? No, 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 no. Uh, so what I need to do is simply to bring value to everyone who reads one of my books. I need, what I, I don't have to write good stories, although I try to write good stories. I would like to write good stories. All I need to do is to give value. I write about what I, whatever has happened in my life. All, most of my books take place in Harlem. Where was I raised? Harlem. I played what sport? Basketball. My son doesn't play basketball. No. He, he, plays, he plays a kind of preppy basketball. He's six foot, he's six foot seven. No. Six foot seven, his arms go out to here. He wears a 15 and a half shoe. Check his feet. No, he doesn't play ball. No. <laughs> um, whatever has happened to me, I dropped out of the army. I mean, dropped out of school, joined the army on my 17th birthday. My um, brother, one of my brothers, uh, joined after me. He was killed the very first day in Vietnam. So I write about war over and over again. My other son, uh, six foot four, they were all bigger than me. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, it was in the Iraq War, so I wrote a book about that. I just finished writing a book about World War II. Whatever happens to me, whatever concerns me, becomes a book. I have many, many, many stories to tell. My days my day's work, and this is so easy, this is so good, you know. I get up in the morning at 5 o'clock, I get up at 5 o'clock, 
come downstairs, feed my wife's ugly cat, you know, uh, and I write five pages. I write five pages from the outline that I've produced. As you know, all, my, all of my characters are on the wall behind my computer. I sit down, I look up, there are my characters on the wall, uh, there, there, here's my outline, here are my character studies, and I write five pages, five pages a day. And I'm finished at 10 o'clock. Is that an easy life or what? <laughs> it's, an, it's an easy, easy life. Uh, I divide all writing into three uh, steps. The first step is free writing. Second is writing, the third is rewriting. I'm a fairly decent rewriter. I'm an okay writer, but I kill free writing. I mean, that, you know, the biggest reason that people fail at writing is not that they write badly, is that they don't finish books. If I, if I went to any college and grabbed every English teacher and shook them, an unfinished book would fall out. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. But what I can do is finish books, and that comes from the free writing. When I finish my day's work at 10 o'clock, uh, my wife rolls out of bed, you know, <laughs> comes downstairs, and I start my, my regular day's activities of aggravating her. Uh, that's good. You know, if, you, if, you were in, if you were in my neighborhood, you come by, you can aggravate her too. You know, it's, 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 it's good. You know, and, and I'll do pre-writing on other books. I'll do pre-writing on other books. Uh, after a while, I began to read less. You know, I, I didn't give myself time to read, uh, so I would read maybe two books a month uh, or three. So now I'm forcing myself to make sure I, least, I read at least one book uh, a week. Um, so, and at that, at that rate, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, let's go back to the idea of the classics. Should kids read the classics? Yeah, I think they should read the classics. We should first define what the classics are, because the, what the classics are is changing. The classics don't have to be the same classics that I had when I was a kid. Um, let's, let's talk about, um, are there enough classics today to go around? Are there enough classics? Yeah, any, any, anyone here could come up with, with 500 books and say, these are the classics. You know, these are the best books that have been published which is suitable for, for young adults. And if a kid read a book a week, it would take him 10 years to finish the classics that are currently available. Now, when, you know, some, some people are complaining, women complain to me about, oh, these books on vampires, you know, they, they don't lead to Shakespeare. Yes, they do. Yeah, they do. I mean, if a book is written about a vampire, it doesn't mean that Macbeth disappears. If, a, if someone uh, writes a book, Fifty Shades of Grey for Kids, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make Othello disappear. It doesn't. The books are there. You know, what we should be worried about is are, are there enough new readers to, to, one, to support a nation? You know, one of the things that my older son uh, was saying, uh, he retired, he's a, he's a retired Army major. Uh, he said that you have to design weapons for people who can't read because not enough people can read well enough to, to handle all the sophisticated 
weapons. You see the drones that they have now? Now they have a drone plane, that's a, 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 a drone bomber that takes off from a, a carrier. These drones, this is very complex stuff. And you know how hard it is to find people who can, who can handle this stuff? Over the weekend, they were talking about having women in combat, right? That's nonsense. They're not going to put that many women in combat. What they're going to put these women doing? Technical jobs. Technical jobs. This is what's going to happen. So can we get enough people reading to support a nation? We have been a nation uh, which has been blessed with a high, high literacy rate. We have had people um, who have built libraries, built libraries. All the Carnegie libraries in this country, this is, this, the Carnegie libraries were, were the greatest gift that any person could have given to this country. Libraries across the country, They're built by, by Andrew Carnegie. Free libraries. Isn't that wonderful? But now, who's going to be, go to the libraries that, that, are being, that are being closed down? What are we going to do? We're not getting the intellect from the lowest economic groups the way we have traditionally done. Does it sound like an old man's doom and gloom? It is to an extent. It is to an extent. But if we can do at least two things, and, and I'll have you all raise your right hand to do these things. Be concerned about literacy. Be concerned about literacy. Don't worry if there's a dirty word on page 73 of a book. Be concerned whether young kids can read. Be concerned about that. That's, that's the first thing. And don't ignore that large percentage of, of, of kids who can't read. Let's find ways of getting them to reading. Let's find ways of, of, of using the collective genius of this country to bring reading to everyone. We've done it before. We've done it before. We, we had a, a population of Africans just re newly released from slavery, and in two decades, we brought them to a high level of literacy. We can do that again. We can do that again. You know, this is a wonderful country. Let's keep it that way. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be signing books. You can catch me on the way to signing books. You can come to my, my house to aggravate my wife. Uh, I'm, I'm very much open. And if you have ideas for me, give me a call. Write my publishers. Thank you. Did you want to take any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Easy ones? <laughs> yeah. Check, check. <laughs> Hi. I, I just want to say this is not a question. I just want to let you know that having worked in a high school library, your books went over really well with our reluctant readers. And I think it was because I attribute that to you because the, it was really hard to find them anything else, but your books really reached out to them, and we were able to at least facilitate more literacy because of your books. So thank, thank you. you. When you were mentioning about the lack of libraries, <laughs> I heard about last summer there was a principal of a school here in Gaithersburg and she took her um, station wagon 
and loaded it with books and would go around in the neighborhood lending the books out to the kids like a library. And it just touched me so because that, that you're right. Right now, Gaithersburg does not have any library because one's being built. But it, I, I think, how are the kids over here in this neighborhood going to get all the way over there? Well, well, that's, that's, right. well th that's, that's what you got to do it yourself. <laughs> that's, that's a national problem. It's a national problem. And it's not only a national problem in this country, but it's a national problem in the UK, in uh, uh, Canada, and Australia. So, Hi. Um, first off, I just want to say I'm a librarian in Baltimore County Public Libraries, and we just built our 19th library. It's the largest one. And we have 129,000 books that we just bought for it. So libraries may be in trouble, but we're trying. And the new push is for outreach and to get out to the people. The people don't come in as much, but we are getting a lot more younger people coming in. And part of it is because of writers like you, because they're looking for people they can relate to in their books, just as you said. So don't give up hope. We really, I mean, I'm a librarian and I fight every day and we fight for, for literacy and to get children. We just had 120 kindergartners I, I, come in. And I, I, so, I, I understand yeah. that there are, I understand that there are uh, uh, good pockets of good things going on, mm -hmm. but I travel from coast to coast, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it for 40 years, and I'm saying we're not winning the battle. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you.